Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. I've got repeat guest and honored guest, Mr. Seth Golden. He's back. He's the retail guy. Well, sure, he's a, he's a lot of other things, too. Uh, <laughs> he loves to short volatility products, and he's in many sectors and does many things. But when I have questions about retail and where it might be going for the rest of the year and beyond, I turn to Mr. Seth Golden. So thank you for joining me to get, uh, today once again on Looking at the Markets. Thank you again for having me, David. I uh, appreciate the, the time, and uh, hopefully we can uh, lend um, some good thoughts and analysis on the retail sector for, for your audience. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll also touch on uh, the fact that you you do still um, do you, you invest other people's money and make amazing returns, and we'll definitely touch upon that as well. I know you're a modest individual, so you may not like to talk about that, but darn it, <laughs> I'm going to talk about it for you, whether you like it or not. Sounds so. good. <laughs> uh, but today's target is Target. See what I did there? All right. So we're going to talk about Target and retail in general. Uh, right now, I'm on the Target corporate website. And uh, I'd like to just really quickly, so we have some context, read off what they had to say about their earnings. Um, again, this is from the Target official website. Target uh, first quarter, 2017. Earnings, GAAP, earnings per share from continuing operations of $1.22 and adjusted earnings per share of $1.21 were above the company's guidance of $0.80 cents to a dollar. Notice how they spun that in a rather positive way, <laughs> and we'll talk about whether it really is positive. Um, and it says here, Target Today, report. well, this was a, you know, a couple weeks ago, reported a first quarter 2017 comparable sales decline of 1.3%. Hmm. And the quote yep. is, uh, Target's first quarter financial performance was better than our expectations, reflecting a strong execution by our team as they delivered for our guests in a very choppy environment. After starting the quarter with very soft sales, we saw improvement later in the quarter, particularly in March. And that's according to Brian Cornell, chairman and CEO of Target. All right. So, uh, of course, they put a positive spin on that. I want to find out what were you, what is your general take on those quarter one results, and what are the pros and cons as you went over those results? Okay. Yeah. So uh, they handily beat both the top and bottom line. I think they beat the bottom line by roughly thirty cents, and uh, top line by you know, half a billion dollars or so. Um, what I think happened there was, yes, it was a little bit better than they had guided to for the first quarter um, of the of uh, fiscal 2017, and analysts actually went below that. The analyst estimate for same store sales was negative three and a half percent, I believe. Mm. Um, so coming in at just you know negative one point three percent. You know that that looks really good. However, it is still a decline year over year, and all metrics, all metrics did decline year over year. Even though they beat, um, they were, you know, they beat analyst expectations, which were very very low. Um, so, I would say from that perspective, it was a a modest quarter, in that it wasn't even as bad as Target had thought it would be. Um, and there were a few things that they were up against in the quarter, uh, one of which was a major factor that affected all retailers, and that was the, the late tax return filings right. um, or, or tax returns, if you will. Um, so, you know, the consumers just they, – they withheld their purchases for a great portion of the quarter, and that's why the cadence of sales and traffic during the quarter um, got better with each passing month. So. I think they noted on the conference call that January was slow and February was slow, but March really picked up and even into the second quarter, which is April, was even better than March. So that was a big headwind over Target and their peers. Um, gross margins did decline, um, but that was also something that was expected. Target had outlined um, in their guidance that they were going to 
invest a billion dollars into pricing and, and gross margins for the year. So they they fully anticipated that gross margins would decline, not in just this quarter, but for the you know totality of the year. Some of the sore spots, you know, when we talk about pros and cons for the quarter, well, let's start with pros. Right. Uh, the pros for the quarter were um, they touted some market share gains in apparel, uh, specifically children's, swim, um, athleisure, uh, you know, some casual wear, if you will. Um, and even though, you know, some of the uh, men's, you know, men's, and David, you know this from me, Target – Target and men's apparel do not go hand in hand. Um, so this was actually one of the first times that I've heard them talk about men's at all, men's apparel at all. But nonetheless, they took some market share uh, with men's apparel. They had a really strong performance in electronics and entertainment on the heels of some uh, product launches from Apple and the Nintendo Switch which I'm not familiar with, but um, anyways, uh, that was a big thing for the quarter was Nintendo Switch. Uh, GameStop uh, touted the game, um, Nintendo Switch sales. Um, Best Buy talked about Nintendo Switch sales boosting their results. So it looks like that was a really big uh, product line for the quarter, and it helped Target's electronic sales. They said it was one of the highest um, electronics and entertainment category performance that, that they've had um, in a number of quarters. So uh, those were some of the pros. Um, some of the cons were, even though apparel sales, they, they took some market share and certain uh, subcategories of apparel did well. As a, as a whole, it still um, saw a negative comp for the quarter. Grocery and essentials, still saw a negative comp as well. And that's been a really big head, headwind for them for, for quite some time. Uh, grocery, no matter, it seems like no matter what they do, whether you know they refurbish it, they launched a PFRESH program many years ago that didn't pan out. Uh, they changed the assortment. They add produce. It, you know, it just still hasn't turned into a positive business segment for them. And we're talking about a very... Uh, margin constraint business, the grocery business. You're lucky as a grocer if you get 10 to 15 percent margins. Um, so negative comps just really compound the issue when it comes to their grocery business. Yeah. Um, so I would say those are those a lot of the the pros and cons during the quarter. Interesting. Wanted to talk about Target's bathroom policy. Uh, some people see that as an obstacle for consumers. Uh, is it even relevant? Should we even be discussing Target's bathroom policy anymore? No, it, it really is just a headline. It's it's much ado about nothing. When we when we look at that whole situation and the what was it the you know the there was a a million people you know that were that protest against it or signed a petition. Yeah. That's that's a million people. Remember, if we go back to 2013, Target had the data breach. It was the first major data breach for you know any significant company, you know, in the United States of of size and scale, multi billion dollar company, and that affected 40 million people. 40 million card holders at Target were affected. Yeah. Sales, you know, took a really nice dive, but. You know, no more than a year, year and a half later, you know, Target was, you know, showing positive sales, positive earnings, uh, all time record high earnings. So you take 40 million people that were affected then right. versus the 1 million people that, you know, are protesting and sign this petition about Target's bathroom policy. They just don't equate, yeah. it, you know, it's a non factor. It, it can't move the needle for Target. I tend to agree with that. Um, interestingly, we've seen in the news recently that uh, Target has been settling, um, right? The, the, finally, the the whole data breach from 2013. So, do you think the trust is there among the consumers now? Yeah, I would say trust has long, uh, long since been restored. For, for Target, it's more about, you know, how do we capture more foot traffic how do we capture a bigger ticket size how do we get guests into the store more frequently and how do we make the guest shopping experience that much more user-friendly across all the sales channels whether it's in store 
or online? How do we do that? How do we service the customer better? So the trust is there. It's really just, you know, how do we get the, the customer to purchase more? Yeah, that's what it's all about. Uh, I want to read another quick quote from Brian Cornell, chairman and CEO of Target. This is from the Target corporate website. Quote, we are in the early stage of a multi-year effort to position Target for profitable, consistent, long-term growth. And while we are confident in our plans, we are facing multiple headwinds in the current landscape. As a result, we will continue to plan our business prudently while preparing our team to chase business when we have an opportunity. So at least he's admitting the headwinds, but he seems pretty confident. What do you think now? We've heard your comments in previous videos about Mr. Cornell. What do you think of him now? I think he's making you know great efforts. Um, you know, I, I've been critical of, of Brian in the past, Mr. Cornell in the past. Um, I remain skeptical. Look, you know, Target didn't get here all of a sudden. This has been, you know, a, a pretty uh, consistent spiral downward since Brian Cornell has taken the helm of Target. So, you know, let's let's if we fast forward to 2018 and they actually do trough here in 2017 only to start you know resurging in 2018 um, do I give him credit for you know re rewriting the ship uh, yes absolutely I give him credit but the ship should have never um, you know had have taken this dive in the first place so I think a lot of the initiatives that uh, the management team is putting forth are are well intended I think some of them will show some rewards, some benefits um, to both the top line and bottom line. But long lasting, it's really hard to pinpoint anything that Target is doing today that actually differentiates themselves from their peers or competitors. Yeah. Most every retailer is doing the same thing. Buy in store, I'm sorry, buy online, pick up in store, ship directly from store, you know they're all pretty much doing the same things when it comes to addressing the greater demand shift toward online shopping so I really don't see anything that they're doing as being differentiated however they are taking advantage of their position in the market and their position is large you know they're they're, they're a very big company they have an outstanding balance sheet so as a management team, they're taking advantage of that. And that is absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, it will ultimately lead to better results in the future. I sure hope so. Uh, I mean, it says right here on the website, for full year 2017, the company continues to expect a low single-digit decline in comparable sales. Right. That, that I don't know. Is, is that is, is this a culture of low expectations? Can can target can be uh, be sustainable as an organization just based on low expectations? That's how it starts. You know, you set the bar low. You know, that's you know what you have to do. You kind of reset you know expectations for everybody, be it the analysts, your investors, even your your management team. Um, you know, it becomes a self fulfilling prophe pro prophecy. You know that you you allow yourself to jump over that very low bar which is exactly what they did in the first quarter right um, now if we look at what you just read from the target website um, it's you know kind of an update of guidance which is pretty much the same guidance that they've offered in the beginning of the year yeah. but based on that first quarter re based on the first quarter results what target is showing is a lot of discipline in both expense side management as well as demand creation and those those two factors seem to be you know working really well could they have raised guidance even a little bit I think they could have I think what you saw there was a little bit of sandbagging and a little bit of cautiousness on the part of the CFO and CEO and in this environment I think that's very prudent um, you know, let's say they beat again in the next quarter, then you've got something that is showing a trend, a new trend, and more than likely the stock will be re rewarded for it. But if you raise 
if you raise guidance after that first quarter and now you've set the bar higher, that's just too soon. You're, you're setting yourself up actually for failure. Um, so I think what they did was prudent. And I, you know, Brian, I, Mr. Cornell, on the conference call on a number of occasions when the analyst questioned them about the guidance for the remainder of the year, um, he said very plainly, um, we think it's still a reasonable approach to, you know, be cautious at this time, um, you know, even though they did have a relatively strong quarter in the first quarter. Wanted to talk about retail in general. Um, you know, it seems like everybody hates retail still. Uh, yeah, everybody loves Amazon. Everybody's hating on, let's say, Sears. Uh, although, mm-hmm. interestingly, Sears had a huge earnings beat recently. Uh, J.C. Penney and Macy's are examples of companies that did not have such luck <laughs> recently with uh, earnings. They had horrendous earnings misses, actually. Um, so let, let's start with Sears. Uh, is Sears a viable business in the foreseeable future? I haven't seen Sears change its business model since it's gone since it commenced this the path that it's on right now. Um, Sears has done a lot of asset sales. Well, that'll help your, you know, your bot, you know, what your bottom line looks like. But a lot of these are one-time sales. You know, you you can't sell the same property twice. You can't sell the same uh, proprietary brand twice. These are one-off events, and that's why the stock never sustains these so-called squeezes, which aren't really squeezes. All it really is is the shorts repositioning themselves at a higher price point. And that's why the stock comes down. I think it's down, you know, pretty so given up a lot of the gains from yesterday. Um, but no, I, I don't see anything that Sears is doing um, that will lead them back to a place of viability as you say or long-term growth one of the problems is when you start closing stores um, people stop going no matter where they are you know if you close a Sears in my town I'm not when I see a Sears in another town I don't go to it because in my head I think well they're closing I don't want to buy anything from them eventually this store is going to close you know what else I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna go online because I think the online business is obviously going to close with the rest of the business. Um, no, unfortunately, I don't see anything changing for Sears. What a shame. I grew up with Sears, and uh, <laughs> it saddens yeah, me. It saddens me, me really. But me uh, that, that's more nostalgia talking than, than my uh, trading and investing uh, you know, part of my brain. <laughs> so, uh, And, and uh, <clears throat> finally, we've got... Uh, well, let, let's talk about J.C. Penney. Uh, is is this just a, a niche mark? You know, too narrow of a niche market for J.C. Penney to be successful in the future. I like you know when it comes to we talked about targets initiatives. Um, I really like some of the initiatives that uh, J.C. Penney has put forth with uh, Marvin Ellison, the CEO. Right. I really like some of the things that they're doing. Um, unfortunately, you know they're they're in a tough position because of the amount of debt they're carrying. And while they're paying down some of the debt, that seems great on the surface. They're paying down some debt. Yeah. They have asset sales. Um, they had one big asset sale that they completed during the quarter, which artificially inflated their EBITDA. You know, when you have a one-time sale, that's all it is. They're not going to get to sell that item again which is why the stock fell off. You know, people looked at the the headline numbers and it was a huge beat. But when you, you know, when you lift the hood of the car, you realize what the beat came from. The sales were terrible. They were much worse. The same store sales were much worse than analysts and investors had expected. Um, so JC Penney is in a tough position. They have way too much debt. And they're closing a, about 130 stores. And here we go again with the problem when you close stores. And we've seen what has happened to Macy's. When you close stores, it just it becomes one of those things that doesn't stop because it's embedded into the consumer's mind. You're going out of business. So it's really tough to capture those sales in your other stores. People just stop going to you all together. 
and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where more stores have to close. In 2016, when uh, Macy's uh, coined their restructuring program, they outlined they were going to close uh, 30 to 40 stores. No more than six months later, they had to boost that to 100. This has literally happened to every retailer of significance and scale throughout history. There's no such thing as shrink to grow. It has never worked in the big box retailing business. So JCPenney has its work cut out for it because they're going down that path. We're going to close X amount of stores because we think it'll bring more profitability, even though history tells us that it just doesn't work. So if anybody does have a chance based solely on the initiatives, which are somewhat service oriented and encroach upon the um, you know, Home Depots and Lowe's of the world, JCPenney has a chance. But they really have to execute. I mean, the execution has to be perfect. Otherwise, you know, they're going to be in a tough spot. You know, they started selling appliances. They started these different home service programs for HVAC systems, for flooring and furniture. There's no marketing. There's there's literally no marketing for it. They just hired a new uh, you know marketing exec, but the the original exec left earlier in the year. So they've implemented all these new products and strategies that nobody knows about unless you go into the store. And guess what happened in the first quarter for J.C. Penney? Last foot traffic. So you're spending all this money as uh, you know J.C. Penney is spending all this money. But nobody's coming into the store to see what they're spending it on. I'm being, I'm saying that in general. Obviously, people are going in the store, but fewer and fewer people are going into the store. So, how do you get that message out? You spent all this money on new product, on new services. You know, you got to get that message out there. So, I'm looking forward to the Father's Day and back to school season to see what that marketing message is around all these initiatives that J.C. Penney has put in place. Yeah. New products doesn't do much if people don't know about them. Great point, and uh, wow, really interesting. Uh, this is Seth Golden I'm talking to. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, we're talking at Seth CL. Did I get it right? Seth CL on Twitter. You got it. And Stock Twits, which for those who don't know, is a StockTwits.com is a message board exclusive to stocks, options, commodities, things like that. It's kind of like Twitter, but for us finance people. And you can find Mr. Seth Golden at Seth. Uh, it's at Seth Marcus. Yes. Um, very good. All right. And what's great about Mr. Golden is that he tweets out both on Twitter and on stock tweets many if not all of his trades and investments for everybody to see and so there's no reason not to follow him on both stocktwits.com and Twitter as well as check out his articles he's a frequent uh, article writer for talk markets talkmarkets.com and okay. seekingalpha.com and elsewhere. Uh, now, for those who have a little bit more capital and would like to have Mr. Golden uh, do the investing for them, that is now an option. He is, I believe, currently accepting on a limited basis uh, you know, people who would like to invest um, with Mr. Golden. Uh, in golden capital management golden capital portfolio management uh, can you tell me about the returns that your portfolio has earned this year so far uh, so this, this is the part where yeah, I don't like talking <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah well I may I invest in volatility pretty heavily with um, you know uh, golden capital portfolio management we do a lot of volatility investing uh, we are short VIX leveraged instruments. Um, and that's been a core strategy for the portfolio since 2012. Um, so we we generate very high rate of returns on on invested capital. Uh, my favorite VIX leveraged ETP is uh, ProShares Ultra, uh, two times leveraged, yep. and the ticker symbol is UVXY. Yep. I've been short this instrument since 2012. In the portfolio, we maintain a 20% core position at all times, and we add to the position on spikes. We intraday trade. 
um, when there's an opportunity. Um, and if anybody you know uh, needs any information on VIX leveraged ETPs, uh, I, a lot of my articles outline um, my strategy, what these instruments are, how to use them to your benefit. Um, and you'll see that a lot of my uh, Twitter uh, tweets are my actual real-time trades yeah. from the brokerage account, um, you know, that I just cut and paste from the execution. Um, and I would say 90% of my trades are UVXY uh, trades. Um, year to date, um, we've broken 80% ROIC, return on invested capital, 80%. Um, and we're, you know, looking to have a triple digit return again this year, which would mark four years in a row. Unbelievable. Triple digit returns. Yeah. Is it okay? Can I say, can I tell your uh, returns from the past years? I've got them right here. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're, you're a modest sure. individual. In 2012, Golden Capital Portfolio Management generated returns on capital investment of 72%. Already phenomenal. Check out 2013, 127%. 2014, 119%. 2015, 202 percent. 2016, 164 percent. It's only May in 2017. So far, 80 percent thereabouts. Unbelievable. I, I've I've spoken with so many people, and I've never seen anything like that. Um, so, for those people out there who would like to have uh, Golden Capital Portfolio Management, uh, you know. Do the due diligence and the research and the investing for them. Uh, their fees are extremely reasonable, and I've seen it, so I know. And um, is it okay? Would you like me to give out your email address so people can contact you? Yes, that's perfectly fine. Okay, that is Seth S E T H, and then a dot or period. Golden G O L D E N at, and this is one word. Cool links it, and I'll spell that C O O L. I N X I T dot com. Seth dot golden at cool links L I N X it I T dot com. Uh, send him an email. Uh, he's you know Mr. Golden is great about answering questions, uh, sending a you know a document letting you know what the, his portfolio is all about. Um, you know, David, if I can if I can interrupt you there yeah. just to uh, give a little bit more background on the portfolio. Sure. Um, you know, the greatest portion of the portfolio is dedicated to VIX leverage ETPs, but we also have a large cap, mid cap, and small cap strategy as well. Um, some of our, you know, bigger, more familiar names um, that you know investors, uh, you know, probably participate with um, that we own in the portfolio are Facebook, Intel, Microsoft. We bought Starbucks in the last quarter and are doing really well with Starbucks. Costco is a, one of our core retail holdings that we uh, invested in last year and we are, we've done phenomenal in it. One of the, um, you know, what I, what I do for clients is whenever we do take a new position of significance like we did with Costco last year, um, I do the full scale analysis and report yeah. and send it out to all of our clients so that you know if they have any questions they can refer to it and we can discuss it as well but um, this is one where the actual thesis um, was not just Costco is a you know a, a unique business model um, when it comes to retailing they have a they have a kind of a different you know spin on it with the memberships and whatnot but we also I, what I did was I I tracked the the special dividends that uh, Costco pays and that was one of the main reasons that we invested in it. The growth was there, the expansion was there, the profitability was there, um, but if I could invest during a time where it was reasonable to forecast another um, you know, one-time special cash dividend to shareholders, it would be a home run for my clients. Right. And that's exactly what happened. Last month, they announced a $7 uh, special cash dividend to investors, yeah. which just entered our account uh, today. So um, I haven't updated on our ROIC 
yet, but I will be doing so over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, outsized returns. Uh, again, you know, past performance is not necessarily an indicator of future returns. We cannot make any guarantees, and nothing in this video is an offer or recommendation to buy or sell anything. You have to do your own due diligence. But, uh, you know, if you're not at the very least uh, checking out Mr. Seth Golden on Stock Twits at Seth Marcus, uh, at, Seth, at Seth CL on Twitter, and you can also email him, and I will put all of those links in the description of this video. Mr. Seth Golden, thank you so much once again. I, I learned quite a bit today, a lot to absorb, and that's okay. And you're welcome back anytime, sir. Thank you, David, and I uh, hope your audience uh, you know, got a lot of information out of this, this video. Have a great day, and always appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.